happen at Lehigh Carbon Community College, which is the LEA of our program, and that means where the funding filters through. Um, I've been there for 14 years um, in workforce development. Um, I kind of did a, a bunch of different things, uh, two plus two plus two, two years of high school, two years of community college, two years of fourth, uh, four years. I've developed um, a bunch of career programs, and for a very long time, I was at the, our institution, and there was always um, a little pot of money that every grant came with for career development. And they always gave me um, ideas, job shadowing, or um, taking tours of manufacturing places, or um, speaking engagements. And I always thought to myself, wow, that's not going to get them. That's not going to make a difference. What is really going to make an impactful um, experience for young people? That they are going to get on the right track, and they're going to think about what they want to do in first grade, and in second grade, and in third grade. And how can we bring in the parents into that, or the grandparents, who are the foster care parents? How can we bring them into that mix too, so we can really put them on a pathway to success? And not only that, to get them into maybe a technical school to get a certificate, to truly understand what manufacturing is, to understand what experiences are out there, what jobs are out there, and also to, you know, let's be honest, change the lives of some of the kids that were, um, you know, serving. I'll be honest with you, 88% of the population that I currently serve um, in Carbon is Google County, which is a very rural area. We cover 750 square miles a night. Okay, we have very little resources uh, when we started, which Jeannie will talk a little bit about, but we really only had our districts um, and a few really important people that thought that you know they wanted to create something that would make a difference. So I, I ask that you know when we start to talk about the process, if you have questions, I'm pretty informal. I get really excited and I move around and I flip my hands because it's super, super important to me. So um, I will talk about Shine, but I really wanted to bring um, the person with me who started Shine 13 years ago um, from nothing and kind of talk how uh, a needs assessment uh, started a movement in Carbon as Google County. Um, I'm not going to I'm going to let Rachel take care of the mission. Uh, well, uh, just a little bit about uh, the process. We actually did, when they talk about, imagine what a caring group of individuals can do, you know, they can change the world. And we started out with a bunch of people sitting around the table. They're, some of them were like elementary principals. Um, they had to be young women who were elementary principals. Eventually, they ended up being superintendents. And uh, they were kind of along for the ride. But what happened was we, as a community, and we were a rural community, um, a group got together called Partners for Progress. And they, they wanted to evaluate, what, how are we going to fix How are we going to improve the economic development in our county? And then soon after we got together, we realized you just can't say we're going to improve the economic development. You, you needed to look at the educational piece and the health piece. You need to look at the criminal justice piece. So we realized it was so multifaceted what we needed to do that out of that came um, something called the Educational Task Force and eventually a collaborative a group of individuals like you from different, um, different walks of life. And we got together and what we did was we created and looked at a number of assessments like what what's happening in our county what's happening with our students what's happening in education what's happening in workforce what's happening in mental health what's happening in higher ed and we looked at that and um, we went through something called family service system reform which is a fancy name they had in Pennsylvania it was the in thing at that time that was back in 2002 basically what it was not Rachel was that slide on here about um, the uh, uh, assessment Okay, um, so what we did is we went through a process of assessing the community needs, prioritizing needs, and then we implemented. And what we found was, number one, we needed after school programs, academic support. Eventually that evolved into um, STEM career awareness activities. We needed behavioral health pro issues were a concern. Um, and the third was early childhood programs that started with parenting right from the very beginning, from the, before the child was born. Um, so those were our priority areas back in 2002. Um, I'm sorry that one slide will show you, uh, we'll eventually pull up a slide that show you, I think it's in your um, packet, but it shows we created 
Um, we started out in 2002 with our evaluation. In 2004, um, we started our first educational program. It was called Parents and Teachers. It was for birth, ch pregnant women or children up to age five, and we implemented that program in our rural county. Um, then in 2004, that was 2004, 2004 we opened up our, our Shine Centers. Our Shine Centers started out, and I want you to envision this. When I start saying these things, I want you to re realize there was nothing there before we started. Um, we started this big arc. So we started out with the early childhood program, home visiting, all home visits, working with parents, what your children need to do to get ready for school, what kind of thing are you interested in as the parent for your career? Connecting them to the community college, connecting them to the career and technical education programs, ensuring their children, um, empowering them to be their children's advocates for education. So in 2004, then we started a first to third grade after school program. There was nothing there in our um, school districts. So now we had a pre-K program to five. Now those kids in the home visiting program, if they needed support, they would continue on into a kindergarten home visiting program. So now the school districts are saying these children still need help. So now we have, we're targeting the children in kindergarten who need academic support with home visiting once a week. Then we build in a first to third grade program. So those kids could seamlessly go into a first to third grade program at the school district, which um, included monthly programs for the parents, a lot having to do with, now it's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, career and technical education. So now we had kids from pre-K up to third grade. And we were keeping the kids. And we were getting incredible results. We were seeing, in the school districts were seeing, they're seeing increased academics, improved attendance. Um, they're seeing parents who are more engaged in their children at children's education. They, children were more aware, be honest with you, we, and I was just telling someone, they, they were talking about the 3D printing. In first grade, we have th children in first grade who are doing 3D printing and um, uh, building doll houses and electrifying them and solar energy, and then they're taking, now they have trouble with math during the day, but if you get them on Tinkercad, which is a computer-aided drafting program, a first grader, they can design furniture that goes into a dollhouse that they electrify, that they put solar, that someone comes in from a construction company. So you can see what we do. We build in those careers, we build in academics, and before you know it, the teacher's saying, you know what, Johnny's doing much better in math now. Because we're making math real to Johnny. We're using strategies that um, are helping him to succeed when he goes back to the school. So the school districts are seeing more engaged parents, students are improving in their academics. So now, okay, so we have the home visiting program, pre-K to, excuse me, birth to five. Then we have a kindergarten home visiting program. Then we have a first to third grade program. Um, then Rachel comes between having children and implements a, at the fourth grade, then we implement a fifth grade program at the career and technical school. Um, <coughs> And that was one of those innovative things. That's a flagship program of Shine, to have a middle school program. So you have fifth graders doing um, CNC, um, electrical, building race cars, learning about systems. You're preparing them for the workforce. So bottom line is we created from that original needs assessment a, a pathway from, pre, from birth all the way to high school into college. If I would show you, which I think we have on, okay, he's gonna, she's gonna show you. If I, can, if I can have you envision something, there's these dots we're gonna show you. There was nothing there, nothing. But a group like you sat around a table like this, started brainstorming, and we created an incredible pipeline. Our career and technical school has increased its academics and it's increased its numbers of students. I think 40 some percent of the students who went into the career and technical programs this year came from the SHINE program, and then we articulate them into the community college. 
Um, so that's the pipeline we've created. At you, there's the picture right there if you want to hold it up underneath there, the arrows. I'm going to go to the sign up. Yeah, that one. If you could hold that up, that's, that, that picture, there was not, I think there was two dots, the Head Start and another program through Penn State. When we started this collaborative, that's how we built this pipeline. So in 2004, we've gone full cycle to, um, to create this, we call the Arrows, a seamless network of educational services. It's a seamless network of educational services for career and college readiness. And my last final thing was, one of the reasons why we we're so successful, and Rachel would go into the goals, is because we had champions. You were talking about, champ we had people like you who are champions. Um, we had um, senators and parents and business people who believed in this and advocated for this program. Um, we had, I talked about a judge who wasn't well, but carried all these big um, pamphlets, big, big posters across the, the uh, courtyard into the Capitol because he wanted to tell the legislators that these programs worked. Um, so that's, that's how we got started and we started out with 125 kids and now they're up to 703 students in the program and Rachel's going to give you some of the um, incredible um, aspects of the program. It's all based on promising practices or research-based practices and she's also going to show you some of the return. But that's how it started with a group like you with a bunch of champions believing and we just it's like the little engine could. We just kept going up that that hill and everyone else, things kept going and coming, but we just kept going and this is what the result of the program is and now it's um, replicated in um, three different counties. So I'll let you take over. So um, the goals of SHINE uh, have not changed over the last 13 years, um, which is really exciting. You know, STEM has really just popped over the last six, seven years, and you're starting to see it. Now we see STEAM, actually, anybody see STREAM? We've added an R into uh, STEAM, so they're an R for reading comprehension out. But these really are our main goals, and they do not change um, from year to year. So improve academic performance, improve student behavior in classroom attendance, increase knowledge of STEAM. And when I say that, I'm just not talking about, um, I'm, I'm talking about them understanding the careers understanding what precision machine is, understanding what welding does, understanding what math is involved in precision machining, um, to really get a hold on what opportunities are out there and what really is STEM, because we know STEM is all around us, and to facilitate family involvement um, in the student family learning process. Now, we have, uh, under me, I have 11 after school sites that are spread over 750 square miles. Once a month, in all 11 centers, which is 99 a year, we bring in the parents for a STEM parent engagement session where they do a hands-on activity with their children, usually facilitated by the students, and the parents really understand what their students are doing um, in the classroom and then in SHINE. So one of the, uh, when I talk about SHINE, I really think of it as a prevention tool, obviously a career pipeline, but a, a prevention tool for um, some at-risk children who can really need um, a little extra support. So um, before a child walks into our SHINE Center, so every child has a referral from either the classroom teacher, the principal, sometimes outside agencies. Um, we've got police, children, and youth, juvenile probation has made referrals. Usually on a referral, a teacher will tell me that um, this person is struggling in uh, this concept in math or this concept in reading. Um, we look at the behavioral issues, we talk to the guidance counselor, we talk to the principal, we find out what's going on in the home, we do a very complete application process. Now, um, one thing that we've learned over the years, uh, we talked about how difficult it is sometimes to get parents involved. Um, so we really start the shine process with the family and again, it's whoever is important in that child's life at that point. So we work the application process together. Um, you know, we don't always just send home a packet and expect the parents to fill it up, because guess what? It won't always happen. So we really try to work with the families, the, 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 the schools, to work together to get that application um, filled out. The more information we find out about each one of our students, the better we do. That's just like, uh, you know, as an employer, we want to know the more about our employees how we can motivate them, what that, it, it, they make better employees, hence better students. Um, 
So when the, before they walk into the center, we have all the information. Each child has an instructional plan, okay? So we know all that information. We put it, an individual plan together for each child. Um, we work the plan all year. Um, so each one of our centers, we have uh, certified teachers. So the majority of our, t our schools, um, we have teachers that work. And then after their school day is over, they then come to Shine and work for Lehigh Carbon Community College for the rest of the day. Um, so instructional plan for each one of our students. We do four hours of professional development every month for every one of my 82 teachers. One of the best things that we've done um, is implement professional development because I think we all know that um, there's so many new things going on out there and it's important that we grow as professionals, we grow as teachers, we grow as families, we grow as parents. So we really feel professional development is important um, for our staff to become better um, in the classroom. Regular communication with the parents. Wow, parents, sometimes communication can be difficult. We use everything we can do. We do newsletters from, um, monthly in all 11 centers, um, texting, phone calls, the family nights. You know, we probably have 80% um, family involvement, which is unheard of. And I'm not going to tell you that happened overnight. It has been developed. Um, it has been tough. We have had to work at it. Um, but that has been a really um, core part of Shine is the regular communication with the parent or whoever is important in that child's life at that point. Um, and then engaging student at-risk students through hands-on activities. You know how many times a teacher will say to me, um, Susie didn't want to come to school, but now she has come to school because she wants to be in the after-school program. And any truancy issues that school districts might be having with that at-risk population, you get them engaged and you get them excited and that truancy issue will go away. And when I say engaged and excited, I like to call our classrooms uh, creative chaos. So when you walk in, they, some of them will be reading in a little area. Some will be doing um, Legos in the beginning. Some will be doing um, homework. So it is um, an empowering, compassionate environment. We are working on their homework. Um, we do concentrate on the subjects for only 25 to 30 minutes, actually. Um, 21st century programming, you're not actually allowed to work on homework over 30 minutes for students. So we really concentrate on the core issues where the children um, are struggling. So uh, the cycle of a quality after school program. So obviously we talked about community partnerships, the parent involvement, the daytime after school partnerships, quality programming. Now, um, OST uh, out of school time is just starting to um, get stronger a movement um, you know in our country and one of the reasons it's because it is a very useful tool um, not only for the families but also for districts because we know how um, districts are struggling now with tech performance scores uh, PSSAs keystones and one very useful tool is a quality after-school program because you can reinforce everything that's going on in the classroom in a strong quality after school program. And we can do a lot more in that after school space because we're not tied as much to those regulations that happens in the classroom um, in the after school pace. Staffing and training, um, we talked about, we'll go to professional development, management and financing, um, research and evaluation, and then policy and adv advocacy. So this is what Jeannie was talking about. I think I have those circles available. Pop these all <laughs> So that's, that's, what, that's what we so when we started in, in 2002, with the exception of the Head Start there in Penn State, there was none of those programs. But due to the work of the community, the community um, members, <coughs> we pieced that together and I think we've created a very, very interesting pipeline which um, we think is, is um, definitely going, is an advantage to our um, business and industry. And, and, and the other thing Rachel will talk about, it makes better teachers. Because our teachers who go to those professional development, the superintendents and principals will tell you when they come back into the classroom after they've been a shine teacher, they're better classroom teachers. So um, all our centers are in the schools. Okay, so when I say 11 centers, each one of the schools have a separate shine center. And they're usually first, second, third, and then fourth grade. Our fifth grade go to our technical schools. Now my middle school programs, we bus every night the students to the technical schools. 
So my whole curriculum is based on um, the technical school. So when I first started to create the program, I was telling Chad, I went through and had tours of the technical facilities and I went um, like a sh uh, shop area to shop, technical area to technical area, and I met with each industry professional. And we sat down and we talked about what we're doing. They talked about uh, you know, what, how they're utilizing the machinery, and I said, what can we do with middle school kids? How can we get them excited about CAD? or precision machining, or automotive? How can we talk to them about uh, opportunities in PP&L, or UGI, in the natural gas industry? And what I found was we have some of the most incredible talent in technical schools. Some of these technical teachers are unbelievably brilliant. The math and the science that they're utilizing in these technical schools, in the precision machine shop you want, it's the, the math involved is insane. <coughs> So I started to think, I said, how can we develop our whole curriculum around the technical areas that we have? So we worked with the, uh, the technical um, teachers and we really developed a 36-week curriculum for the middle school kids. And they are based on six-week career projects. So that is a start and an end to every project. So we usually break them up in groups because we know in business and industry we have to learn to work with other people. We know that it's sometimes we all have different personalities and it's not always fun, but we have to always be respectful. We have to always listen to different people's ideas and we always have to get the job done. So we always set every project up with this is what our goal is, this is what the end goal is, and guess what, sometimes we have things that do not work and they fail to what happens in a business everything doesn't always work. We always have to troubleshoot programs. So as we started to develop the curriculum, we saw that um, kids that normally would not have walked into the technical school started to want to come to the technical school because they saw new opportunities. So 44% of all our um, incoming ninth grade class are SHINE students, and the majority of those students are AD students um, from the ascending districts. So. Um, you can see that after the middle school, we actually developed a ninth to 12th grade mentoring program. And I actually, we opened our first uh, um, sophomore, junior and senior, our senior um, SHINE program as well. Which I will tell you something about older kids. Older kids are really hard to motivate. Once you hit eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, well, wow, to get them in the door and keep them in the door is a struggle. So one thing that we've really learned is kids like to work with younger kids. Older kids like to do mentoring with younger kids. They love that. They like to do community development. They like to look at the communities that they're living in and they can tell you what they want to change. You can ask any child and say, what would you want to change about the community you live in? And they could tell you what they want to change. So anything you can get kids motivated to change their community in a positive way is going to help. And then because we are very lucky to have um, L. Tracy, a lot of our children do dual enrollment classes. So in junior and senior, they are actually getting college uh, credits in their high schools, which um, is awesome, and they actually get it at a reduced rate. And then our children then matriculate to the L. Tracy either for um, some type of certificate, um, a two-year associate degree, and now we currently have students that are transferring into uh, four years now, because we are 13 years out. So now we're seeing longitudinal data that our kids are graduating, and they're going to community college, and we have graduation rates now and we have kids that are in four years. Um, so that's how you know that it's working when you start to look at that longitudinal data. And I can tell you right now, none of us would be standing here if we would not have started to measure what we were doing. Because every time I walk into a legislator or a senator or a congressman or I'm in Harrisburg or I'm in Washington, D.C., the first thing they say to me is, Rachel, how do I know this will work? I am not going to invest a cent into a program unless I know that it's going to work. And I can pull out my 208 pages, which I love those 208 pages, of data, and I say here, and they're like, wow, that's a lot. And I'm like, you, that's, it, it's working. And you know how much it costs per student for a year of shine? $1,200. Now I want you to think about that. Busting 750 square miles, giving them a hot meal every night. Certified teacher, one of the best after school programs currently in the country, and we're only it's only twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars per child. Now let's think about if one or two or three of those kids get off track, okay, and we have to place them in out of out of county placement or the juvenile delinquent, how much does that cost? So if we really think about an after school program as number one, a prevention tool, a fiscally responsible prevention tool, and also a career pipeline. OST is a, one of the best ways to invest 
um, and children. So uh, we talked a little bit about our kindergarten home visiting. So all our kindergarten um, are home visits and our teacher, certified teachers go into the homes um, and they work on uh, you know, reading math and science with our kindergartners. You know, our, our hope with our little ones is they don't need us. So if we can stop any academic issues in kindergarten so they don't need us in first, that's our goal. That doesn't always happen and a lot of them do come to us in first, second, third grade. But you know, getting into that home in kindergarten is super important. I don't know any of you have relatives that are teachers, daughters, uh, wives that are teachers at one point. One of the best ways to find out what's going on in our, our children's homes is really do a home visit. You know, we we're in classrooms sometimes and we look back at our children and we'll see a young child back there sleeping and some teachers would think, wow, how disrespectful is it that that child's, and sometimes they are being, but there are other times that that child is not sleeping at night because they're taking care of a younger sibling or they're tired because they don't have enough food in their bellies, okay? The food insecurity in our country is amazing and you heard me say a hot meal. We serve 3,300 meals a month, okay? so. Just feeding a child is making a difference because that means they're staying awake in class, they're being more active with the teacher, and they're participating. So just giving that hot meal is um, important. So these are just some of our uh, pictures, STEM in the gym, different things that we do. Let's engineer together. Um, engaging parents through STEM. So we, I talked about the uh, elementary centers, family STEM engagement nights. Um, take your parent to shine. So. One thing we've learned is we have to empower our families and to get them into uh, the school was very important. Um, to get them into the technical schools is very important to really understand what's out there for their children so they support their child um, in any um, you know, decisions they make. So we really try to involve the parents, but we have the, uh, the, the students really facilitate those activities because we want them to guide uh, the learning process. Um, I talked about uh, the family, so we do GED. A lot of our families, parents, maybe didn't graduate high school, so we try to work on GED, ESL, credit, non-credit. So a lot of our uh, parents, um, you know, because of Shine, we will uh, link them to Lehigh Carbon Community College, and they will take uh, credit and non-credit classes. Some uh, CNA is a big one that a lot of our parents do. Welding, forklift operating, um, anything that would be short-term that they could get a job right away is really what we want to help them do. Um, and then I put the FTEs, the connection to the community colleges. Okay, so uh, I talked about the instructional plan. We always focus on the student strengths. You know, one thing that uh, always bothers me about education is we always call home when a child is what? Not doing what they should be doing. We always call mom and dad when Susie isn't listening or we never call home and say, guess what? Today, Susie learned to um, do this. I really, really encourage all our staff to take the opposite approach and we really call home because those at-risk parents, they need positive reinforcement too because a lot of them are struggling with a lot of different things. And when you call home and tell them that their children did something awesome today, that makes it better for the child. Student challenges, um, that's, you know, academically they might have some needs. Um, our reading goals, math goals, and social goals. I can tell you, reading is a big issue. Fluency and reading comprehension is a huge issue across the board for incoming college freshmen mm -hmm. taking uh, anything. So when college students are coming to L3C, one of the big issues that all professors will tell you is they are not ready for college. So we really feel that um, this is always obviously getting students ready as well for um, you know whatever they decide to do. And then social goals. So uh, social emotional learning, uh, I'm sure we all obviously have heard what that is. That's really to focus on those leadership skills. That's focus on good decision making. That's focusing on um, future plans. That's anti-bullying programs, that's anti-drug programs, it's just called something social emotional learning now. That's a very big thing across our country currently. They're starting to dump a lot of money into that because they realize that some of our students are lacking a little bit of grit that get up and go. We're struggling as a country to get that millennial generation to get out emotional learning piece is really important. You know, one thing that always um, bothers me is why one child they're maybe in the same environment. Um, they're both struggling. Maybe mom and dad are struggling with drugs or alcohol. Um, and how one makes it out 
and one does not. So they're in the same environment. What does that one child have that the other? So if we can figure that out, that's a big thing because that you know some kids were missing. We got to figure out how to uh, you know get a hold of that. Okay, our lesson plans. So um, support meaningful learning. So all our teachers again are certified teachers, and we do a lesson plan each night, four nights a week, three to six, thirty-six weeks a year. So it's very similar um, to what's happening in the classroom. We evaluate all our teachers. Um, we really try to um, hire teachers that think outside the box and um, want to do new and different things and want to say, you know what, this isn't working for this child. What can we do to make it work? Instead of making the child fit into our little box, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to help the child um, grow. And then daily out outline of STEM activities. So 35 minutes of homework. Then we do, um, we usually do some type of physical fitness activity, activity only because our little ones, it's a long day for them. And then we do serve a hot meal every night. And then we do an hour of STEM activity. So uh, Jeannie talked about one. Currently, we are, uh, have engineers and we are building farmhouses from scratch. So we use the computer aided draft tinker pad. They actually did the um, drawing of the barn. Then they printed out mini barns in the 3D printer. And then they physically built the barns uh, out of kits. And our little first graders actually printed out animals and they learned about agriculture um, and different like, materials in agriculture. What schools in our area, Penn State, we're close to Penn State, has a very good agriculture program. So we learned about hydroponics. Um, we have greenhouses right now, so we built put 11 greenhouses in every center and we're growing things um, in our centers currently. So quality program, again, uh, the data I cannot uh, stress enough. So the instructional plans, um, that drives the assessment. The STEM activities, uh, increased academic and STEM careers, and then the evaluations. Um, and then evaluate strengths and challenges to create measurable goals. Now, one thing I will say about Shine is um, we, one of my big fears as a leader is you never want to get complacent and you never want to get to a point where you're just like happy. Not that I'm not happy, but you want to make sure that you're always growing and you're growing with what's going on in your community and what's going on in your state. So we really watch what's happening as our state. Our whole um, elementary curriculum is based on high priority occupations in Pennsylvania, which means the curriculum is ever changing. So what's happening in our state is what's happening in our classrooms, okay? So uh, depending on, um, you know, especially also in a community, uh, we have a um, fire, uh, Kovach, which is the number one manufacturer of fire trucks in the United States of America. Um, we work with them a lot because that's one of the number one employers. So we really look at where the employers are in the communities that we serve and how we can really drive our children um, from elementary to middle to high school, um, either the community college, the technical school, and then right to business and industry. Um, and um, our industry loves that. You know, they love to know that we're talking about them in our classrooms. They love to know that second and third graders know what is happening in their plans. And um, also talking with the parents about that as well um, is super important. So, the, oh, this is one of our, we build race cars. Awesome. So, we work, who, who watches NASCAR? Anybody, the NASCAR, okay. So uh, Pocono Raceway is a, okay. So currently this week we're taking all our middle school kids to Pocono Raceway and we built a two seat car and then we race in the car. And here's my thing, it makes my tummy hurt a little bit because I get stressed out that the children are racing the car, but they love it. Um, so we built the car from scratch. So we start an automotive and we do welding and we do precision machining and they do the whole thing in the technical school. The kids design it, they print it in the 3D printer, they get to race it and it is awesome. That is a really good, um, it, it's just a good thing for the kids. It's a super well-rounded activity. You know, they learn about all the STEM in NASCAR, all the science in NASCAR, and the kids and the parents just love it. So um, we do a lot with race cars. That's usually the STEM activity. Um, kids love culinary, anything um, molecular gastronomy. They love anything like that. Um, so we've done a lot with them. And then uh, to manage data effectively, you must be able to collect the data. So, I'll be honest with you, the trying to collect 11 centers, and it's immense amount of data, so we use 21 sources of evaluation between kindergarten 
in high school. It has been a big process. And you know, uh, when Jeannie first started, it was used, it was really Excel sheets. And do you know what it's like doing Excel sheets over and over? It's a lot. So uh, over the last three years, we've transitioned to a data management system, which is called KN. And everything is computer generated directly from the sites themselves. We monitor attendance. We monitor the food. We monitor uh, everything is done on the computer, all our STEM surveys, all the report card data. Um, we do have external evaluators, which we pay, we pay a lot of money for them, but they're super necessary because that's really who looks at our data at the end of the year. And uh, you know, it's not all, it, we don't have perfect data. You, we're never going to have perfect data. One thing that I really feel is important when you are an administrator leader, you want to look at the good and the bad in data. You want to know where you can grow, and you want to know how you can get better. So that's, I really feel data is really important, um, the quantitative and qualitative. You know, uh, our superintendents, our principals, our community, you know, we survey everybody. I want to know if we're communicating okay with our superintendent. I want to know if uh, our parents aren't happy about something. Um, maybe we can, we're can. we not measuring something in our elementary program well enough. I want to get better at that because that's how programs like this are going to grow. Um, and also, the other thing is we wouldn't be replicating anywhere now if we wouldn't have the data because if we didn't have the data to back it up, you know, we, we would never know that uh, programs like this are uh, you know, a viable option. Um, you know, for a prevention tool. So um, here's just the data collection pipeline, the parents, the school teachers, guidance counselors. I will not tell you that sometimes uh, the data collection piece with, you know, we're, I have, what, nine after school, school districts, and they all collect data in different ways. And we have to work with all the different administrative systems, all the different principals, but we have to get that information. And maybe the first couple of years, but, it's a struggle sometimes, you know. You but, system. Yeah, but after you get the system in place and the administration and the teachers understand that we are there to help them and we are there to work together. I think in education we sometimes, in a lot of ways, we want to be territorial. Not only education, everybody wants a little piece of the pie. But we will never grow if we don't work together as a team. We all do things amazingly well. And we, also, we have to learn what we all do well and we have to pull each other's um, skill sets together and I think that's what we've really done at Shine. Um, this has not been one person or two people or three people. This has been a group of individuals who believed in changing something and um, making a difference in kids and families lives and you know I think that's why it has been so successful because it's come out of pure you know a pure place. So oh, some of my favorite parts. So this is obviously a nine-year average um, and this is all our students. So um, you can see across the board, the home, I'm not going to read all this information, um, uh, you know, where we have, uh, you know, been successful. So we're talking about 81% of our, all our students, every child that walks in. And again, this is not me. This is, we do measurements from the classroom teachers. So uh, I really think it's effective. You need to know what the classroom teachers are saying. And the classroom teachers are saying it's working. And we're looking at the report card grades. The report card grades are getting um, higher and PSSAs, I'm going to be honest with you, I know PSSAs are super important and in Pennsylvania it's like the end all be all when it comes to everything but I'm going to be honest with you, PSSAs, there's so many things that can go into a child being successful in the PSSAs that you cannot, you cannot manage. So let's, let's be honest with you, if we have an at-risk child who has to take two days of testing and they haven't been sleeping, Okay. If we have an at-risk child who uh, maybe was pushed through and now they have to, you know, they don't understand the core, they don't know addition or they don't know subtraction, you know, PSSAs are important to a certain extent, but, you know, I don't put a lot of, um, I think a year's growth is more important. I want to make sure that a child walking in our center has made a year's growth and they've grown in our centers and they've grown academically. That to me is more important. And I also want to know that their confidence level is rising. And I want to know that they feel better about themselves. Because you know what? There are times in their lives where I'm not going to be there or the teachers aren't going to be there to pick them up. We, they have to pick themselves up. And Shine is not always going to be there. But they have to learn to be there for themselves. And one of the ways, um, you know, is obviously do that. So this is uh, the teacher survey, what I was talking about, the academic performance. Now, one thing that we have found is this. 88% of all our children stay for three years or more, okay? 
So which means that a lot of our children did not need to improve and improve. So this is um, you know, the improvement. But what we're seeing now is we're stabilizing, okay? So when we're getting the teacher survey back, we're getting a lot of students that did not need to improve because we've stabilized them from the year before or the year before. So we're retaining our students. So instead of we've stabilized around 80% of our students, but now we're, we're holding steady because we're retaining our students, which is what you want to do. The scary thing is if you see kids coming and going, um, my thing is, is that when I open a center, you're usually going to lose 10%. When you open a brand new center, you're going to lose 10% of kids, usually in the first two or three weeks. It's a long day for them. Um, maybe they don't like it. But you want to keep around 85, 85% and 90% of your kids, and you want to keep them for 36 weeks. That's how you know you're doing what you need to be doing. You want to retain the students. You want to retain the students from year to year. You don't want to see a lot of fluctuation. If you can keep an at-risk population in this system, that is going to make a measurable change in so many different areas within a community. A huge difference. And then these are science grades. Um, you can see these are all uh, above average passing. Um, so this is up until 2016. And then uh, here's some of our professional development. Um, we do a lot with innovative technology. So anybody here ever see ZSpace? Do you know what that is? It's the new virtual reality uh, software. So it's actually a computer. A lot of medical schools are utilizing it now for dissection. It's a cheaper way than buying cadavers. Actually, the nursing programs are using that. Um, we use, utilize ZSpace a lot. Um, when we purchase a uh, piece of equipment, we do uh, very extensive training on it. I have a STEM troubleshooter. So we bring every um, teacher in and we do an in-service on that technology. One of the most ridiculous things is I think when you buy technology for teachers and or whatever and you don't in-service teachers and you say, here, go utilize this. So I think professional development is really important. I think it's cost effective to teach people how to utilize things. You get more from your money when they understand what they need to do and how to implement it. Um, Geomotion, monthly STEM training, the culture of poverty. We take all our staff to the culture of poverty. They need to understand what's going on in our community, what's going on in the homes. Um, we give them, I don't know if you've ever taken a simulation, it's pretty, um, it's pretty difficult. They give you a certain amount of money. Um, you walk in the door and they give you some issues that maybe some of our families are going through. And you have to make it. it it's pretty unreal when you only have 20 some dollars and you have to feed your children and you have to take a bus ride and you have to, it's amazing. And it's, some people, it's actually a life altering. I've actually seen teachers have to walk out because it's incredible because you actually then think to yourself, wow, I have children in my classroom that are first and second graders that this is going. So uh, it's very powerful culture of poverty. Um, Project-based activities, we do not do the same pro uh, activities year after year only because we are retaining the students. So we need to make sure we alter the curriculum. Um, some we do just because the kids love them so much. Um, but we really change our activities on a yearly basis. And that's really driven, that's really driven by the uh, classroom teachers um, I really let them um, take a hands-on approach um, to shine. Um, and then here's just the birth to career pipeline. This is the STEM pipeline. Um, so, you know, the STEM, pro the STEM things that we do are obviously in starting in kindergarten. So our kindergarten, let me just shut off the side of the phone. Okay, thank you. Um, the whole way, so you, we could probably ask the kindergartner in Carbonus Google, Hazleton, and or Wilkes-Barre, and they could probably tell you what STEM is, and they could probably name a STEM career. Um, so we're working really hard to uh, you know, let them understand that. So this is really uh, the return on investment for, for each um, entity. So schools increase attendance, uh, increase in academic achievement, improvement in classroom behavior, parent engagement and literacy for technical schools, increase student in interest, increase enrollment, dual enrollment, and the pipeline to technical schools. Um, and then business and industry, STEM pipeline into workforce, students who are STEM literate, students armed with skills necessary in the future workforce, um, finding hidden STEM job economy, electrician, CTC. Now, this one, I'll be honest with you, I don't think we ever saw coming. So, uh, I don't kn think we ever really knew that the connection with business and industry was going to get as large in it as it is. Um, I think we, as the model progressed, um, you know, I do get out there and I talk a lot, but the business and industry component has really been very, very strong for us. 
I think business and industry obviously really want to invest in something in, in, back in the community that's um, sound and that uh, it's positive for them. But it's actually going to funnel children into their pipeline or potentially into their jobs. AT&T is one of my national sponsors. This is no lie. My One of my administrative assistants uh, said, Rachel, at and on the phone. I said, I don't even have at and Why is at and on the phone? So I took the one. He's, this is the senior vice president of at and uh, We would like to donate. I was like, what? So we met and we, so at and is a national sponsor now. And, you know, they're mentoring our students now in high school. So they're sending people from at and and they're working with our juniors and seniors. And they see it as a sound investment, um, you know, into their, you know, into at and And obviously, you know, people like to invest in strong programs that really benefit children in the community. Um, UGI. Another one, natural gas, anybody here? UGI is a big supporter um, of Shine over the last four years. And that one was, uh, I wanted to do, I did a natural gas conversion with a diesel engine. So we got a little Omni, everybody knows what that little, a little, it's like those little cheap, tiny car. And we switched the engine from diesel to natural gas. And I called them and like, hey, we're doing this really cool activity. And they're like, wow, we love this. And then they sunk half a million dollars in us the last four years. So I've learned that uh, this and industry really want to invest in things, um, you know, that get kids excited about education and then not work. So business and industry have been really important. Um, advocates, banks. 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 Um, so we've had, I was, we've had a lot of uh, interest from um, uh, maybe $50,000 in the last six months from um, some larger banks in our area. Um, obviously they get the tax credit. EITC is a big one for a lot of, um, business industry, they like that tax credit, but also um, it, it's positive PR. Uh, legislators, and um, so Shine has really had a bipartisan push at the state level. So uh, we had a very strong champion and a senator years ago and he passed away in a car accident. Um, and it, his uh, really pet project was Shine and we were able to push through a, a line item in the Pennsylvania state budget. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Pennsylvania state budget. It's, Every year, it's like a fight. So we've actually pushed through a half a million dollar, almost half a million dollar uh, statewide budget item just for Shine, which is unheard of in after school programming, getting um, funding. And then we get 80% of it comes from 21st Century, which is the, the only dedicated source of after school funding in the whole United States. Uh, each state gets, I think you guys get 21 million, which is not a lot. You actually might have one of the smallest um, uh, allotments. It is, it goes by population, right? Uh, title one. Oh, title one. So, um, so the 21st century funding and then donations. <coughs> but we've had a lot of support uh, from Congress and uh, representatives and senators, and because it's a uh, you know it's something that affects their community. And again, regardless of where you stand politically, it is a fiscally sound investment um, that works.